Hello, I am Joanne De Janeiro, president of the Center for Excellence in Education located in McLean, Virginia. I co-founded this organization 36 years ago with the late Admiral H.G. Rickover, father of the nuclear-powered submarine and civilian uses of nuclear power. The center's mission has remained focused to nurture high school and university scholars to excellence and leadership in science, technology, engineering, and math, and to encourage STEM collaborations. The center's programs are unique. All of them are cost-free to each invited student or teacher thereby leveling the playing field for all youth to help them realize their dreams to pursue successfully careers in science and technology. Nearly 400 guests have registered for this public service event for them to receive cutting edge, up-to-date, relevant interpretation of information about hacking the coronavirus. Our panel is composed of outstanding scientific and technological leaders, alumni of the center's world-recognized Research Science Institute collaboratively sponsored with MIT. It is offered annually to over 50 very top achieving academic U.S. students and joined with 30 scholars from other nations. No U.S. student pays a fee to attend the six-week program. However, international students are financially sponsored by their respective nations or corporations or organizations. Our illustrious panel will be moderated by Aaron Kesselheim, a 1991 alum of the Institute. It is a pleasure to have Aaron lead his fellow alums for this special event. I take pleasure in introducing Aaron. He is a professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School in the Division of Pharmaco epidemiology and pharmacoeconomics at Brigham and Women's Hospital. A practicing internist, lawyer, and health policy researcher, Dr. Kesselheim founded and leads the program on regulation, therapeutics, and law called PORTAL, an interdisciplinary research center focused on intersection among prescription drugs and medical devices, patient health outcomes, and regulatory practices and the law. Dr. Kesselheim also serves as the Sydney Austin Robert D. McLean Visiting Professor of Law at Yale Law School. Author of over 400 publications in peer-reviewed medical and health policy literature, Dr. Kesselheim has testified to Congress on pharmaceutical practice, policy, and drug prices, served on an FDA advisory committee, and has been selected to two national academies of science, engineering, and medicine consensus committees. He also is a member of the Perspectives Advisory Board of the New England Journal of Medicine and Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. I take pleasure in having Aaron take it from here. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mrs. D, and, and, and thanks very much to Mrs. D and the Center um, for developing this idea, and it was uh, a pleasure of mine to organize it with them. Um, the, the crisis has been a really, the, the, the current um, coronavirus crisis has, has really been a challenging time, but it, it is also an opportunity um, to really bring out the best in the science and healthcare system. 
Um, and I think we see that with the heroic response of some of the frontline um, doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers, um, but also in the scientists, the epidemiologists and immunologists and virologists and microbiologists and chemists um, who have thrown themselves into trying uh, to find a way out uh, of this mess. And so um, it, it gives me a lot of, uh, a lot of joy and, and pleasure to know that uh, RSI alumni uh, are a key part of that effort. And uh, we're gonna hear from uh, some of the, some of the um, you know, most, most uh, preeminent ones uh, today um, to talk about how science and technology are meeting the challenge of, of the current pandemic. Um, the way that the session is gonna run today um, is that um, all of us are gonna get about uh, 12 minutes to talk. Um, and uh, one of the nice things is that I, I think there's a mute button here. So if people go too long, we can uh, start to, um, we, we can uh, impose a time restriction on them. Um, but we're all gonna get about 12 minutes to talk. Uh, and then there will be some time at the end um, for question and answer. I know that some people have submitted questions ahead of time um, to RSI. Um, and if you submit questions on the, uh, on the chat uh, feature, um, I can try to compile them uh, and, and, uh, and present them at the end uh, and the end to the group. So uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, the panelists for today. Um, the first, uh, first you're gonna hear from Lauren Ansel Myers, who was uh, RSI class of 1990 and one of the counselors when I was uh, uh, at RSI. She's the Cooley uh, Centennial Professor of Statistics and Biology at the University of Texas, Austin, and the founding director of UT's COVID-19 Modeling Consortium. Professor Myers was trained as a mathematical biologist at Harvard and Stanford, and has been a pioneer in the application of network models and machine learning to, to improve outbreak detection, forecasting, and control. Um, Professor Myers leads an interdisciplinary team of scientists, engineers, and public health experts in uncovering the social and biological drivers of epidemics, and building the practical tools for the CDC and other global health agencies to track and mitigate emerging viral threats, including COVID-19, pandemic influenza, Ebola, HIV, and Zika. Her research has been published in over 100 peer-reviewed articles in major journals and covered in the popular press, including the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, CNN, and the BBC. And she's gonna to talk to us about modeling uh, the coronavirus outbreak. Next, we're gonna hear from Patrick Tan, uh, Patrick Tan was in RSI class of 1986, um, so the uh, grandfather of the group, I suppose. Um, and he is the executive director of the Genome Institute of, the, of Singapore and a professor at the Duke NUS Medical School. Trained at Harvard and Stanford, he's received numerous awards, including uh, the Human Genome Organization's Chen New Investigator Award um, and the Japanese Cancer Association International Award. In 2018, he received the American Association for Cancer Research Team Science Award as team leader, representing the first time a team from Asia had received the award. He's an elected member of the American Society of Clinical Investigation, the Bioethics Advisory Committee, and a board member of the International Gastric Cancer Association and co-chair of the Singapore National Precision Medicine Program Steering Committee. And he's gonna to talk to us about contact tracing and lessons for the US um, from the way that Singapore has attacked the virus. Next, we're gonna hear from Ben Silverman, who is uh, RSI in 1998. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of Pinterest, a visual discovery tool that helps people get inspiration for their lives. Founded in 2010, Pinterest currently provides hundreds of millions of people around the world with personalized recommendation from what to wear, what to cook, and where to go on vacation. Previously, Ben worked at Google and he graduated from Yale. He lives in, in San Francisco with his wife and two sons. Um, and he's gonna be talking about tracking symptom self-reporting. And then uh, finally, we'll hear from Feng Zhang, uh, RSI class of 1999. He's a, a McGovern in investigator and professor in MIT's departments of brain and cognitive sciences and biological engineering. He's a core member of the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard. Um, Feng grew up in, in Iowa after moving there from his, with his parents from China at age 11. Uh, he received his AB in chemistry and physics from Harvard and his PhD in chemistry from Stanford University. He's the founder of companies including Editas Medicine, Beam Therapeutics, um, and the public company Arbor Biotechnologies. He's also a trustee of the nonprofit organizations, um, Science for Society and the Public, and the Center for Excellence in Education. And he's gonna talk about scalable and home diagnostic testing. So um, I am excited to hear what everybody has to say, and we'll start with, uh, with Lauren. Okay, hello everyone. Can you see my, my slides and me, and hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Yep. I got some nods. 
Okay, I'm so excited to be here with all of you. It's so nice to see many familiar faces in the list of attendees. Um, and I'm glad that uh, I had a moment on that video. That was me, the first person on the video, saying how uh, influential RSI and CEE has been uh, throughout my life and has really launched me on the career path I'm on today. So glad I got to say that a little bit earlier. Um, so I am going to take my 12 minutes to essentially give you a, a whirlwind tour of some of the work that we've been doing um, ever since we first got wind of this new anomalous virus coming out of Wuhan. Um, but to set the stage, let me see if I can get this to move. To set the stage, um, I have been working in the field of modeling epidemics and pandemics for my whole career. So I've been building these kinds of models um, since at least 2000, uh, including um, in 2013, we built a whole online toolkit for the state of Texas to help them think about how they might respond to the next uh, pandemic, how they would prepare, make sure they had enough ventilators, uh, good distribution channels for antiviral medications, et cetera. Um, this is just a video of one of the tools that's online um, simulating a pandemic in Texas. Fast forward more recently, uh, when COVID started spreading, we were in the middle of a project with the CDC to build basic, basically a national scale version of the same kind of model, uh, modeling framework. And uh, the, these tools and kind of the expertise that we've developed over the last 20 years um, really positioned us so that we could hit the ground running, uh, adapt our models to, tr to provide decision support at multiple scales uh, since early January. And we have been uh, working with the city of Austin, the state of Texas, the CDC, and the White House Coronavirus Task Force um, over the last few months. Uh, we've also been making efforts to reach out to the public to actually publish some of our models uh, in popular press, to talk about them, to help people understand how this virus is spreading, what we can and can't say uh, with our models and with the data, and what action we need to take as individuals and as policymakers to, uh, to navigate this really unprecedented situation to minimize uh, the, the hospitalizations, the deaths, um, while uh, not de too de negatively impacting our our, our economy and society. So I'm going to talk about three different areas of research very, very quickly. So the first is work that we did at the outset in the first few weeks before we really knew anything about this virus. You know, the first word out of China was that there was this new virus and it wasn't even able to spread from human to human. Very quickly, we revised our understanding, but we were involved in some of that very early grabbing whatever data we could out of China, the first cases that arrived around the rest of the world, looking at geolocation data. So we actually had cell phone GPS traces for uh, hundreds of millions of people in China to try to estimate how quickly might it be spreading, what cities outside of uh, Wuhan might have had cases before the, the lockdown on January 23rd. And some of the things that we found in our very early studies were uh, basically that this virus was spreading far and it was spreading very quickly. So for example, uh, the very early, in, look at the very early data in, in Wuhan and the first uh, introductions of the virus outside of China, we estimated that by the time of the January 23rd lockdown, when Wuhan had only reported 425 cases, there were actually probably well above 10,000 cases at the time. Uh, we also did a very early look at what we call the serial interval. So that is if, if person A infects person B, what is the amount of time or the number of days between person A first developing symptoms and person B first developing symptoms. And what we found was that this virus was spreading very quickly, much more quickly than SARS, which at the outset people were assuming this, this virus would look like. Uh, the, the average serial interval is probably under five days. So you develop symptoms less than five days later, the person you infect develops symptoms. Um, there was quite a bit of silent transmission, evidence that people were spreading disease even before they were feeling symptoms. Um, and, and also that some people were spending, it took a long time before they infected others, which meant that our isolation periods, our quarantines would have to be quite long in order to ensure that uh, a person was not infectious before they went out in public. So that was some of the early work. So fast forwarding to maybe about a month ago, uh, we built a model for forecasting um, COVID-19 mortality across the US. And this is a screenshot of an online tool where you can look at your own state um, and if you live in one of the 100 largest metropolitan areas in the United States, you can also look at projections for your own city where we're, we show the data up till today, uh, how, many, how many cases, how many deaths have been reported for COVID-19 and we make projections about, about three weeks out. And what's under the hood, what's driving these forecasts is not only the historical death data, but also for at a census tract level, um, cell phone GPS data uh, that is telling us a few things. What proportion of the day people are spending at home? And that's what you see in this top graph 
The two different lines in this case correspond to Austin, Texas in solid and, and this whole state of Texas in dashed. Um, and then the six plots below that show our estimates of how many people, uh, how many trips are people making per day uh, from their house to different kinds of destinations, bars, grocery stores, doctor's offices, parks, restaurants, schools. And we find that this kind of data uh, really does seem to correlate with, uh, with how quickly the disease is spreading and three weeks later, how many people are dying from the disease. And so um, we built this, this model, put it online about a month ago. Um, it has been incorporated into the CDC's ensemble of forecasting models. So the CDC is, is following the lead of, of weather forecasting and other areas where forecasting is a more mature science, uh, where you realize that there's no one right model. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of models with different expertise, different data, different structures, different assumptions built in. And to get a robust sense of what's going on, good situational awareness, it's, it's prudent to look at what all the different models are saying and, and try to understand what, if there are discrepancies, what, what's driving those discrepancies. So ours is one of several different models that you can now find on the CDC's uh, webpage. And these models are also uh, being monitored by, in the popular press by 538. They were on the front page of the New York Times yesterday. Um, and so, so the public is looking at these and decision makers are looking at these. So the final thing that I wanna spend, I guess the, lo the longest amount of time on is, is really what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis to try to provide decision support in um, helping our city, uh, our state, uh, and other decision makers to navigate this unprecedented situation. How do we protect our communities uh, without completely locking down indefinitely? So I'm gonna take you through a, a few different graphs just to kind of give you a sense of how we're thinking about this. Um, so these graphs are going to be based on Austin, Texas, but they would really apply to most large to medium-sized cities in the United States, with the exception of the New York area, which, which has already experienced a very explosive uh, wave of transmission. So what might happen if policies are relaxed, let's say today or in, 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 um, in, uh, in Texas, they were relaxed on May 1st, and transmission really does rebound, maybe not all the way up to what it would have been if we were not mitigating at all, but it's Maybe it's 50% of, of what, would it, what it would be if we were doing nothing at all. This is what you would expect to see in Austin. So going along the x-axis is, is, um, is 2020 and then 2021 up till September. Along the y-axis, we're showing you both hospitalizations in red and deaths in black. So this period from March uh, 24th to um, May 1st was the stay home work safe order. That was our shelter in place order in Austin, Texas. If we assume it's relaxed and people go back to life sort of as usual on May 1st, what we would expect to see is an explosive uh, wave of transmission that peaks in Austin sometime in the late summer. That horizontal line there is our surge capacity. So in fact, we only have about 1,100 beds total in the metropolitan area. But we optimistically, you know, best case scenario, maybe we could set up beds in stadiums and, and expand capacity to 3,300 beds. So that's our max capacity. We would blow through that in a matter of a few months. And so those deaths that I'm projecting there, they actually vastly underestimate how many deaths we would see in that kind of scenario. Because once we're past our capacity, not only are COVID-19 patients going to be dying at a higher rate, but so are other, other patients that are in the hospitals for other reasons. So that is, this is a scenario nobody would tolerate. Nobody is going to allow our cities, or if, if, if they can control it, to, to enter this kind of catastrophic phase of a wave that exceeds local capacity. Let's think about the other extreme. The other extreme that is probably not feasible is that we stay locked down. We've estimated that in Austin, Texas, the stay home work safe order reduced transmission by over 90%. We, if we stay in that regime, we manage to somehow really repress transmission, then what we would see is this. I mean, the hospitalizations are there at the bottom. You can't even see them, but that's the little wave that we're experiencing right now in Austin. Those little dots are actual hospitalizations. The red lines are our models. And, and you can't even see the deaths at the bottom of this. So that's, that's the other extreme. This would entail 555 days of lockdown and schools would probably have to remain closed for the duration. So the question is, what, how can we navigate this so that we're not in between these two extremes? How can we ensure that we never exceed local hospital capacities, that we can handle the deaths, we can handle the, the, the I'm sorry, the hospitalizations that, and, and provide health care, yet we don't remain in lockdown for such a, a long period of time that it's just so destructive to our society and our economy. So we've, been, we've built a framework that allows us to derive what we call data-driven triggers. So we imagine we can, we can continue to monitor the number of hospitalizations on a daily basis, the number of cases on a daily basis, the number of deaths on a daily basis. And the question is, 
if we can monitor these and we can kind of think through what the different scenarios are, when and how extensively should we lock down and then relax things in order to, let me, I think I have these things, what is the shortest, in order to ensure we have the shortest lockdown possible while absolutely ensuring we're never gonna exceed our capacity. And I'm gonna show you the example of a solution to this problem. Take it with a grain of salt. These are, this is actually a slide we made last week and we've updated our estimates for capacity uh, in tech in Austin. And we also have us esti updated our estimates of the transmission rates. But this is just to give you a sense of the kinds of solutions that this approach can help us work towards. So this is, this is the, what we project with our model under an optimized solution. And this particular optimized solution tells us that if you monitor the daily number of hospital admissions, as soon as we get to, we're, we're looking at a rolling seven day average, you know, like, so what is the average number of new admissions we've had for COVID-19 in our hospitals in Austin? By the time we, as soon as we exceed uh, a threshold of, I believe it's 80 new cases on average per day in a week, then we need to lock down. And in this scenario, we're gonna assume that we can only be in one of two states. We either can be relaxed or where, where transmission has, uh, has increased to about 50% of baseline, or we can be locked down where transmission has been reduced to about 90, by about 90% from baseline. So we have to lock down according to our trigger uh, sometime in, in June. We will have to remain locked down for about three months until hospitalizations, new admissions subside below our threshold. And then we actually, in this scenario, we would not have to lock down again. We would see a third wave of transmission um, in, uh, in the late, in the late um, fall, uh, but we're getting close enough to herd immunity that that wave would be self-limiting. And so in this scenario, perhaps Austin would, would, would be able to open schools a little bit late in the fall. Thank you. And uh, this would entail about 135 days of lockdown. So, and, and in this case, we, we would expect to see 3,000 3, deaths. And I mean, this is, a, this is an important caveat. In this, we are assuming that Austin, Texas is very effective at cocooning its vulnerable populations. While low risk people are out and about at 40% reduction, whatever it is, people who are high risk or over 65 remain sheltered for the duration. Okay, so this is an optimistic expectation for deaths. So this is why well, when we think about this analysis, which we are doing to support decision-making in Austin and in Texas, we think about this as how to relax social distancing if you must, right? We are not minimizing mortality. We are not minimizing hospitalizations. We are just minimizing the number of days in lockdown in order to ensure we do not exceed capacity. So going from here, what is, what's the plan? What's the model? So that was an example of an analysis, but we are actually doing this kind of analysis on a daily basis in a very iterative fashion with the city of Austin. Um, What's the city of Austin doing? They're trying to educate and motivate the public to take precautions, even if they're allowed to go out in public, to keep their distance, to wear face masks, to cocoon themselves, shelter themselves if they're high risk, so that we never get to the point where we have to lock down, uh, protect the vulnerable populations, and of course, ramping up testing, tracing, and isolation. Uh, and what we're doing as modelers is we're actually, we're now thinking about multiple policy thresholds. We might wanna to toggle between kind of an intermediate level of restrictions and more strict level of restrictions. What should be the thresholds for those? How long should they last? What should we be monitoring? And then of course, we're trying to build the models to really pull the most signal, get the most information we can out of the data, out of the data we have access to. Um, and this is what, what, this is what we're doing. This is what our models look like we're doing on a daily basis. We are tracking hospital admissions, hospital discharges, deaths. We're not really looking at cases because confirmed cases is not a very reliable signal at this point. And on a daily basis, we're estimating how fast is this thing spreading? So, or the reproduction number, uh, how many hospital admissions are we seeing and what do we project for the next two weeks? The same thing with deaths. And so we're finding, so for example, in Austin, before the shelter in place order, we had a reproduction number well above four. At our, our, our most strict moment, we had a reproduction number safely below one, and now we're precariously close to one again. And for those of you who don't know, the reproduction number equal one is the threshold between um, be containing an epidemic so that it doesn't grow exponentially and not containing it. Uh, so with that, let me just say that this is, this what I've shown you today is the work of dozens of people. In mid-March, we, we overnight stood up the UT um, uh, COVID-19 modeling consortium. Um, we meet daily through Zoom. We have lots of collaborators, not only across disciplines at UT, but across the country and across the world. So thank you so much. I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Patrick. 
Well, thanks very much for having me here. Um, and I wanted to tell the audience that uh, if I do sound a bit fuzzy, uh, it is because it is uh, half past four in the morning in Singapore. We're about 12 hours separate from the US. But again, uh, very, very excited to be here. But what I would like to do and my brief here is to uh, describe um, what is happening uh, in COVID-19, uh, perhaps in uh, our little um, country of Singapore, and uh, perhaps some learning lessons or points uh, that might be applicable uh, to the much larger country of the United States. So um, let me give you a sense of the current uh, state of uh, the COVID epidemic in Singapore. We currently have about uh, over 25,000 cases, um, of which the majority, the majority are in a uh, cadre of the population called the migrant foreign workers. Community spread in Singapore is fortunately uh, quite low in the single digits per day. And our overall mortality rate is about uh, zero point, uh, less than 0.1%. Um, and so I think that we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, we're currently in a uh, one month into a period that we call the circuit breaker where it's primarily stay at home, although there is openness for essential activities. Um, I guess my brief here also is to, to talk a bit about uh, some of the approaches that Singapore has used to uh, deal with the COVID crisis. And I guess one of the, uh, in a strange way, advantages that Singapore has had is that we've actually had to deal with a pandemic before true pandemic before, and this happened in 2003, when Singapore and other Asian countries were the recipients of the SARS coronavirus outbreak. And I think that uh, as a consequence of that experience, uh, we learned a bit about how to have various preparedness contingency plans in place if an uh, outbreak like this, and in, in, in the case of COVID today, uh, would come again. So I think that the preparedness uh, framework for pandemics in Singapore and it's being applied to the COVID situation essentially has three major features. Um, the first feature is that it needs to be coordinated across multiple agencies. So a lot of the decisions ranging from uh, which samples to collect, uh, which, uh, what types of testing to do, uh, what are the stay-at-home framework is all coordinated in a multi-ministry way uh, helmed by the cabinet, which is our Singap the highest level of Singapore government. Um, and one of the key elements is contact tracing. So contact tracing allows um, us to be able to rapidly identify contacts of a suspected or confirmed case. And this is really one of the uh, features and this is done through a combination of various means, including activity mapping, data analytics tools, surveillance footage, door-to-door -door in inquiries, and smartphone apps. And obviously this allows us to identify close contacts rapidly and quarantine them so that they can be treated early and not expose others to the infection. And this is coordinated by our Singapore Ministry of Health, but as you can expect, this also involves uh, engagement of many other public agencies and volunteers. So I think that's the first arm of our response. The second arm of our response is timely uh, dissemination of information to the public. And this allows us then to share openly information and the, the situation as it evolves. So this provides a certain level of public trust in case there, are, there need to be certain measures to be placed for example, uh, like this current period of the circuit breaker. So we, uh, our ministers and our prime minister uh, do come onto the media uh, almost on a daily basis to be able to provide the latest updates. And also I think Singapore takes pride in being able to share the data that we have openly so that we are active contributors of our genome sequences of the, of the virus to the public websites like GIS, AID, and also participating in a worldwide co consortia for vaccine development 
and clinical trials. So I guess when we say openness, it's not just within the country, but also as part of a, a global community. Um, the third area that we've uh, focused on and the third strategy is also to develop intrinsic technological and scientific capabilities that can be rapidly applied or mobilized to address these, uh, out these outbreak situations. This comes both from competencies from the public sector research agencies, but also from the private sector as well. And so there's this interesting uh, leverage between the public and private sector in terms of securing resources, mobilizing the workforce, and everybody can band together. Um, these technological uh, capabilities have allowed us uh, very early on in the outbreak to develop our own diagnostic test kits and then to roll them out uh, to the different ho hospitals. Um, and it's also allowed us to be able to modify these kits in a way that uh, re represents the latest information in how um, the virus is, could potentially be evolving. Uh, I myself at the Genome Institute of Singapore, we're contributing to this by repurposing some of our genome capabilities in order to aid the uh, overall testing capacity in Singapore. And with expanded testing capacity, we can then begin to target specific segments of the population for rapid diagnostic testing. Um, so we are also have efforts in um, the creation of va 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 vaccines and new treatments. And all of the information on the COVID uh, viruses, the, the research is coordinated uh, by the Ministry of Health such that there is uh, less redundancy in efforts, uh, more uh, statistical power to rate findings and access to samples and viruses. I think I'll stop there uh, and I just want and uh, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much. Um, ben. Okay, one second, I'll share my screen. So, can everyone see the screen? Yep. Yep, okay. Um, hi, my name is Ben, so I was RSI 98. Um, and I'm like the least scientific on the panel. Um, so why was I invited? Um, well, so uh, when the outbreak first um, started, actually Fung, who is gonna go right after me, uh, who was working on a lot of the biological tests, um, he called me up and said that, you know, we're very far away from uh, widespread testing, especially here in the United States. Um, so what could we do that could give us a proxy um, to understand how many people might be sick? Um, and he thought that maybe a software tool would um, be a useful tool to um, contribute in a small way to fighting the pandemic. Um, and so the one area that I spent a lot of time doing is building software for customers. Um, and so um, we started to build a self-reported symptom tracker um, that we called How We Feel. And so today I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what we're starting to learn uh, from the data um, uh, from How We Feel. So uh, first of all, you know, what is, what is How We Feel? Um, How We Feel is an app. Um, it's also a web survey. And it makes it very easy for people to check in um, every day, it takes less than a minute, uh, and share how they're feeling, um, as well as the zip code that they're in. Um, you know, we took a look at a lot of tools that were out there, um, and we built uh, the software around a few different premises. Um, you know, first we tried to build something that was very universal, so it ran on the big smartphone platforms, as well as the web, it's available in 20 plus languages. Um, second, we wanted to build something that was longitudinal, which is a little bit different than snap polls that you might see um, researchers often sell out. Um, third, uh, to make it adaptable, so as we come up with new hypotheses, since the research is evolving quite quickly, we could add it dynamically to the survey. Um, we wanted it to be de-identified, uh, and I think this is a really important point. Um, as Americans are starting to think about things like contact tracing. You know, one thing that's been really clear is a lot of Americans are very nervous about sharing personal information. So the application doesn't have email or phone number or an account. And then finally, we wanted to make sure it was nonprofit. So the data is not sold and it's actually freely available to any collaborator that's working to improve public health. So, you know, we launched the software, you know, about, oh, and then this is why we made it. So I, I shared a little bit, but, you know, function, there's a lack of widespread testing. 
it's led this huge gap. Uh, and then we'd seen the self-reporting approach work pretty well in other countries. So the map on the right uh, is from Israel. Um, this is a researcher at the Weizmann Institute. Um, and they were able to predict hotspots, uh, you know, five to seven days earlier than testing. Now, in Israel, what was special was the government pinged everybody in the country every day. So they had very widespread adoption. But we thought that was an inspiring approach. Um, the final observation was that in the U.S., it was early, early on, but it was already pretty obvious that the data on both sentiment and behavior was becoming politicized. Uh, and that's only continued. So if you read the news, you'll hear a lot of different things depending on what type of news you read. And so we're interested in gathering some data. So that was the background on it. Um, you know, where are we today? Um, you know, the app has been downloaded, you know, just over 600,000 times. Uh, and every day there are 150,000 and growing um, responses. Um, it's been adopted as kind of an official tool for states like Connecticut and there are more partners pending. And now there are collaborators across many fields, uh, epidemiology, uh, neuroscience, psychology, uh, <laughs> consumer internet, economics, and also Lady Gaga uses it. So you should also use it because uh, she's very famous. Um, and so I wanted to share just some very early findings that we're learning from the data. Um, and I say early, like these are kind of pre-publication, but the analysis team is working on them. But uh, in support of Mrs. D, I wanted to <laughs> give this community um, some early access. You know, I think the first question with this kind of um, survey, since it's not a randomized sample, is, you know, can you actually extract anything useful? And so the first thing we did was we tried to correct uh, and for you know, some sampling bias just to see if the um, survey data we were collecting reflects uh, trends that were observed in, in state level testing metrics. And those early signs look really good. And so once we had that confidence, we started to look at what we might learn about symptoms and transmission. You know, the first thing we learned was that users with COVID-19 symptoms, they do tend to cluster separately from people with other things uh, like the flu. Uh, and the team has been hard at work beginning to build um, a prediction model based on self-reported symptoms. Uh, and I was actually surprised to learn that the prediction um, looks to be pretty good, um, kind of in excess of 70%. This actually says 84%. Uh, we're still looking at it, that you can predict whether someone's likely to have um, COVID-19. This, of course, could be really useful because as we think about who should get tests first, or if you're an employer and you're thinking about whether you should open up or not, if you can provide a privacy safe self-reporting tool, you can make that decision based more on data um, rather than just on uh, something like a temperature or just asking your employees how they're feeling. I thought this view was also really interesting, and this is one of the advantages of a longitudinal view because people are reporting every day. You can see how their symptoms progress prior to testing and then after testing. Um, and, you know, my hypothesis is that this is a lot more accurate because people don't have very good memories about how they were feeling across a wide range of symptoms, you know, one week or two weeks ahead. And so this is a heat map on the left and the, the horizontal axis on the bottom shows the days since the COVID-19 test. And just at a glance, you can see that certain symptoms tend to start earlier and last longer. Um, others are happening like just before people end up going and getting a test. So we might be able to learn a little bit based upon when symptoms are reported and what those symptoms are and begin giving people kind of good information. You know, lastly, you know, we find that a fraction of users, as uh, Dr. Myers said, um, are positive test results, even though they're pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. And so tools like this aren't perfect. And that's why I think everybody who's working on the problem knows that we'll need a lot of different approaches working together to begin to understand who has uh, COVID-19 and then what policy steps to take. You know, finally, you know, we, we find pretty strong evidence of household transmission. You know, we ask in the survey, you know, how many people do you live with? You know, uh, how many of them have exhibited symptoms or have been exposed? Um, and, you know, we find not surprisingly that household transmission is pretty significant. And so what we would expect is just as they found in Asia, um, interfamilial transmission will be a big source of infection, um, especially intergenerational, uh, cross-generational transmission. And, um, that's important because even though social isolating can help with a lot of transmission, um, may not be sufficient to actually stop the spread of the disease if you live in a home with a lot of people in it. Uh, one nice thing about a survey platform is that you can also ask about things like behavior and sentiment. And some of this is the kind of data that can't easily be gathered from just uh, location. 
Um, so um, these are just samples of things. You know, the majority of the people that have used this survey um, are leaving home, and we also are starting to know why they're leaving home. Most of them are leaving home for reasons other than work, although some are definitely leaving for work. And this is kind of independent of, uh, in every state, whether they have social distancing policies in place, we see quite a little a lot of movement, and that's increasing uh, over time. We find that the majority of our users have canceled medical appointments, um, and that the older and more at risk they are, um, the more likely they are to cancel those appointments. Um, so this is, again, why uh, the, the deaths from COVID-19 may not come just from people who are infected with the virus, but may come from decisions they've made not to go get their important health checkups. Uh, we find that users in more dense areas and with higher um, income are the ones that are most likely to be wearing masks. Um, and then I paid attention to this one, you know, we asked people um, which professions tend to be wearing masks. And actually the lowest profession are folks that are in food production. And so as you order your takeout meals, it might be something to think about. Uh, the, it's the lowest percentage of all of the working folks that are wearing masks. And again, this data can be cut by state uh, and all, all of those zip codes. We've also found that the majority of people still don't feel safe to return to work you know, as of our most recent data, although there's pretty significant uh, geographic variation. And then if you cut, about, cut it by what job they have, interestingly, the people that are already in the mode of working feel a little bit safer, um, but you can also see differences by profession uh, within there. So what's next for the project? Um, the next thing we're working on is we're releasing an emotional well-being survey. Um, and this is something that I'm personally very passionate about because with unemployment rising so high um, and so many people being isolated, you would expect that a lot of emotional um, well-being will be at an all-time low. So risks of things like suicide and drug abuse will be quite high. Um, we're starting to put together panels for what we call at-risk communities. So uh, people of color, uh, people in low-income areas to understand how their needs are different. Uh, and then as different states try, try things with different um, policies, we want to understand what's the sentiment on public policy. So the state of Connecticut, for instance, is interested in things like, if you went to a restaurant and everyone was wearing a mask, how would you feel about eating at that restaurant? Uh, because if no one goes to the restaurant, then it actually doesn't solve the problem that they're seeking to solve economically by reopening, but it may increase the risk of infection. I'd also say we could use some help uh, so I thought I'd use the opportunity. We have a group of volunteers. They're all working part-time. Um, so we're looking for engineers, uh, distribution partners, data visualization, just hardworking people. So you can email me uh, if you would like to help out. Um, and, uh, you know, we meet uh, almost every night on Zoom. So you can join one of these exciting Zoom calls that happen at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, and that's all. So thanks for giving me a chance to share and uh, thanks to all the other panelists and everyone who joined. Um, thank you very much, Ben. And uh, unfortunately, I just wanted to tell everybody that, that Ben has to leave at five o'clock, so he's not gonna be able to be part of the Q&A. There was a quick uh, clarification question in the uh, chat about whether food production referred to restaurants or meatpacking. I'll find out and follow up. All right. Great. Thanks very much. Fung, do you want to take it away? Hi. Thank you for um, having me join this panel. Um, so we've been working on um, uh, molecular diagnostics for, for coronavirus. And I uh, want to tell you a bit about the work we've been doing uh, and also where the work is headed. One of the things that we have been working on uh, is to uh, study proteins that are found in bacteria. And one particular family of proteins that we study are called CRISPR-associated proteins, uh, such as Cas9 and Cas13. And there's one protein, um, Cas13 in particular, that has become a useful uh, protein for developing diagnostics. And so one of the uh, techniques that we um, set up a couple of years ago called Sherlock allows us to detect the presence of virus uh, molecular signatures uh, in the form of RNA or DNA um, uh, with very high sensitivity. And the way this works is uh, there's a first step, which is called amplification. It makes more copies of the virus DNA or RNA. And then um, afterwards, then we treat it with the CRISPR protein Cas13. And we program this Cas13 protein to recognize a specific signature uh, on the virus DNA or RNA so that it can cleave a reporter and then give out a, a signal uh, on the lateral flow paper strip. 
So the lateral flow strips are very similar to what you would see in a pregnancy test strip, uh, where uh, two lines means positive and the one line means negative. So earlier this year, um, uh, I read in the New York Times about this new virus, uh, coronavirus, uh, that has been discovered in China and was causing a public health um, a problem. And so I thought maybe we can convert um, the Sherlock test and design it uh, so that we can use it to detect coronavirus. And <clears throat> around the same time, um, I received a large number of emails uh, from researchers in China, uh, researchers uh, in the US, uh, even the Chinese uh, embassy emailed me to ask, uh, what are you guys doing with Sherlock? Can you uh, repurpose it so that uh, we can use it to detect a coronavirus? This is just a picture of one of the doctors in Wuhan uh, who sent me an email uh, early in the year. So we um, went out to work and um, on, val on Valentine's Day, we released a protocol uh, that details how one could use Sherlock for detecting uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. And then we put it up online and uh, got a large number of requests. So we prepared reagent kits and, um, and we sent out these kits to different researchers uh, around the world, uh, some in the US, uh, including in the Nebraska Air Force uh, Air Base uh, and University, University right. of Washington, uh, as well as uh, internationally uh, to uh, China, to Thailand, uh, to uh, many countries in Europe, including uh, Italy. And so researchers uh, began to use these reagents uh, and to carry out um, tests to see whether or not this works on their patient samples. One of our collaborators, um, uh, so, so a number of collaborators sent feedback to us. Um, in general, the test has worked well for, for them in their hands to detect uh, patient, uh, to detect coronavirus in their patient samples. And one of our collaborators uh, in Thailand, uh, Tao, um, uh, sent us this data a month ago. Uh, where he was able, able to get very good sensitivity, 93% uh, in the patient samples that he was testing. And the specificity is 100%, meaning that there is no um, false positive uh, that uh, turned up in the test. And so because of this result, the, the Thai government has become uh, really interested in uh, scaling this uh, test. And so now uh, they're already deploying it uh, in uh, one of the largest hospitals in Bangkok uh, to screen uh, patients who are coming in for surgery uh, and so that they can, um, using an a in, a, in a inexpensive uh, test uh, to, to screen them uh, for coronavirus. So one of the feedback that uh, we got while we were, uh, rece uh, we were working, working with these collaborators to test our original Sherlock protocol is that the test was um, a little cumbersome to use because there were two steps. You have to first um, put a sample into the amplification reaction, and then you have to open up the amplification reaction to transfer it into the CRISPR uh, detection step. And that transfer step is, uh, is tricky because once you have amplified the virus uh, signature, there's many, many copies of it. So you don't want to open it and let aerosol contaminate the work area uh, because that uh, will very easily cause uh, false positives uh, in future uh, tests. And so we um, then focus on trying to make this test easier to use and, and the integrating uh, both of the steps into one. And so this, um, just two weeks ago, uh, we um, released a, a new updated protocol where uh, by, by working on the chemistry, we can integrate everything into just one step. So you add the patient sample um, into a lysis buffer, and then that will break open the virus. And then you add the sample into this uh, detection reaction uh, by heating it at 60 degrees for uh, up to an hour, you can uh, dip a paper strip in and get a readout to see uh, whether or not uh, the person is positive. So this just give you a sense of the comparison of the workflow um, difference between the original protocol and, and the new protocol. Um, so now um, you can get result uh, within about 30 minutes, whereas before it, it takes more than an hour uh, and multiple handling steps in order to get a test result. So this gets us a little closer to having something that can work in a low resource or point of care uh, at home setting. Uh, so the setup is very simple. Um, all you have to do is to be able to incubate the reaction uh, at 60 degrees. So what we did is we, we got a sous vide heater and then uh, used it to heat up a water bath. And then um, uh, the reaction works uh, reliable, uh, re reliably and across 12 
different tests of the same thing, you get very good agreement ag um, across all these different tests, which suggests that assay is robust. We also tested it on a number of patient samples and, uh, and we find that uh, the sensitivity is, is uh, very good and you can uh, reliably detect across a large range of patient samples. And um, for patient samples that are uh, very low in uh, virus amount, uh, that's where uh, you may want to test uh, more than once in order to get, get a, a positive signal. At the same time, any negative patient sample um, doesn't show up. So the false positive rate is zero. So um, from this, uh, we have about 97% sensitivity and 100% specificity. Um, looking forward, we are um, trying to get a, the test to work uh, even faster. So the, the paper strip method takes about an hour uh, to be able to read out. And, um, and, but using fluorescence as a readout, we can get answers in less than 30 minutes. And so uh, what we're doing now is trying to build an integrated device that can uh, read the fluorescent signal uh, it would be a low-cost um, device uh, with a disposable uh, test uh, so that people can um, you know, run this in, uh, in almost any uh, setting, um, uh, either uh, in point of care or, or for at-home use. So, so that's all. I just want to acknowledge um, my team that worked with me on developing this test. Uh, we've been working tirelessly over the past uh, several months to, to get here, and then uh, we'll continue uh, to uh, move the test into an easier form factor so that people can uh, use it um, in, uh, in, in, in the, uh, the most use, uh, in, in the most needed situations uh, for, for, for fighting this pandemic. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Fung. Um, all right. I, uh, I'm going to share my screen and we'll kick off the Q&A. Um, so I want to just kick off the Q&A by, by uh, summarizing a little bit about some of the key issues um, uh, from a policy point of view um, that I think were touched on by uh, Lauren and Patrick and Ben and Fung. Um, and then to pose four, what I think are four of the key questions that we're going to have to grapple with going forward um, in, in all of these different uh, areas of, of science and, and epidemiology and public health. Um, so I've, so one, I think one key question is how do we balance speed and rigor? Um, because responding to COVID-19 has required uh, scientists and physicians to move quickly and, uh, and in some circumstances to try to do the best we can with incomplete information, but there is, uh, there is you know, working with incomplete information, but there is still adhering to thoughtfulness and rigor uh, and making sure that we're doing uh, the best that we can um, to try to achieve the, um, that, the more scientific certainty as quickly as possible. So as an example of, of how this can go wrong, take the early testing rollout um, that, that we saw in the U.S. So as, as Lauren pointed out, um, you know, the first uh, um, coronavirus was identified in China in December um, and uh, the, the WHO uh, came out with a, with a test um, that the CDC decided not to take up, but instead to make its own test. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, the FDA issued an emergency use authorization for that test, but limited it very specifically to just that test and told um, the different public health and private laboratories around the country that they had to stick uh, to the CDC's design and send, and send materials to the CDC. And that adherence to that um, sort of the normal playbook in, uh, in responding to these tests really slowed down uh, the U.S.'s ability to get um, testing up to scale. And, um, and, you know, this may have tried to, you know, achieve as close to possible of a gold standard testing. Now, it turned out that the CDC's test was faulty for a number of different reasons. Um, but it wasn't, it, it, it inhibited our ability to respond quickly to what was, an, you know, a very quickly emerging threat. And there was some thought as to whether or not these early decisions were made with some political expediency to match the um, you know, attitude being taken by the Trump administration at this time towards uh, downplaying the, the disease early on. On the other hand, that, if that's an example of going too slow, on the other hand, you can also go too fast. And as an example of that, I'd point to the first hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine study that was conducted in France and, and, and made available online on March 20th. This was a study of um, a few dozen patients 
um, in a non-randomized fashion received hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine um, with the investigators testing a primary endpoint of unclear relevance, which was virus clearance at six days. Um, this non-randomized study had, you know, they collected limited clinical data. There were major differences in baseline characteristics between the hydroxychloroquine uh, and the uh, untreated group. Um, and then there was some patients that had azithromycin added onto them at the end. There was differential loss to follow-up, which means that some of the patients in the intervention group um, weren't counted um, in the final results. And this test, uh, this study, although it was very poorly done, um, was widely publicized and played up as, as evidence of hydroxychloroquine and actually served as the basis for an emergency use authorization that the FDA issued for hydroxychloroquine shortly after. And then, so maybe in, in terms of getting it just right, um, was, the, was the study that we recently heard about, the, a double-blinded placebo-controlled randomized trial um, of 10 days of another drug, remdesivir, in which there was, a, plus, uh, again, a placebo group and an active comparator um, organized by the NIAID, um, finding that there, there does seem to be a, a significantly improved uh, recovery time, although not a significantly improved survival benefit. And I, just as a point of fact, I would compare that to um, another trial that was organized by the manufacturer Gilead at the same time that only compared five versus 10 days of remdesivir and didn't have a, uh, an arm without remdesivir, which would not have allowed us to interpret whether or not remdesivir was useful at all um, without the ACT trial already existing. So I think well, one of the things I want to talk about in the Q&A period is this uh, getting this right. Another thing I want to talk about is how we combat misinformation. There has been a long tradition in the United States of entrepreneurs and snake oil salesmen seeking to make money and fame off of health fears. Um, and we see history repeating itself in the COVID-19 crisis. There on the left, you can see coronavirus tea um, that is being sold. Um, and, on the, uh, and that's probably not going to injure too many people. But on the right, a much more dangerous miracle mineral solution, um, which, uh, which when, when activated, turns into chlorine dioxide um, or um, an industrial bleach uh, that can really damage, uh, you know, people if they if they um, uh, uh, if they if they end up purchasing this product um, based on the sales uh, pitch. There's also confusion around um, these emergency use authorizations that the FDA offers. These are not approvals. The FDA is not formally approving these products. Um, but yet you can see here this testing company um, putting up on its website that it had an FDA approved product. Um, even though it only had an EUA, and you'd only have to, you have to go down to the, um, to the small print, to the fine print, uh, and ask, is this test FDA approved or cleared? And, and, and you finally get the answer, no, it's not FDA approved or cleared yet. It's only under an emergency use authorization. And these mis mis misinformation has real consequences for patients. This was a study that we did um, looking at uh, internet purchases, internet attempts to purchase hydroxychloroquine through some of the major retailers after uh, there were um, irresponsible endorsements of the, of the medication by, uh, first by Elon Musk and then by President Trump. And you can see here just this massive spike um, in searches to try to purchase uh, this product um, based on relatively, um, relatively flimsy data. Third, I want to talk about how do we better coordinate and organize scientific work. Um, so that figure there um, might look like a virus uh, particle, but it isn't. It's a, it's a network um, that we pulled out of clinicaltrials.gov, looking at all of the different um, large randomized controlled trials of pharmacologic interventions that are out there. Um, and you can see that you know, all the different uh, products that are, and, and that are being uh, tested right now in a lot of different um, scenarios. And, and, but, but the problem is, is that um, these trials are being done in a very heterogeneous way. They don't share similar design features. They don't share similar outcome measurements. Um, the research agenda is partly driven by hype. There are a lot of studies out there um, that have been designed to test hydroxychloroquine, despite the fact that there isn't any good evidence that, um, that it works. Uh, and then they don't really, uh, and then it's also the trials don't necessarily uh, take up robust designs. So on the right there, you can see um, trials in the US and France um, broken out into those that are randomized and double-blinded versus those that are randomized and non-blinded and those that are non-comparative at all. And there's just a wide range of, of different trial designs. And so should there be better organization um, of, the, um, of the scientific efforts in this way? And, and actually, uh, there's some positive news on this end in that there are some initial efforts to try to organize um, uh, um, you know, scientific e efforts from uh, the WHO, the NIH is bringing together industry, the U.S. public health and regulatory agencies. 
Um, and, the, you know, the G20 has established an accelerator uh, to try to do this. And so now there are these mega trials underway um, that, that exist, uh, testing a lot of different comparators, but with com comparable protocols, um, some simple, pragmatic, adaptive designs, uh, and collecting data on similar endpoints, uh, including real clinical endpoints um, like death or the need for ventilation. And then finally, I think an, a really important question is how much we should pay for innovation. Uh, and this is drawn in, in part by the fact that pharmaceutical manufacturers in the U.S. are able to set prices um, without restriction on new drugs. And there's been a lot of controversy about um, high prices for um, important new products in the past. So when AZT, which was the first um, antiviral with activity um, that came out, this was a drug that was um, you know, discovered due to a lot of testing um, through the National Cancer Institute um, and ultimately made available through, from, uh, from Burroughs Welcome. It was made available at a, at a cost of $8,000 per year at one of the most expensive drugs ever sold at the time, which made it a real challenge for people to access the products. And this happened again in the case of the antivirals for hepatitis C um, when they came out a few years back, initially priced at levels um, far beyond U.S. payers' budgets, even though um, these drugs were found to be cost effective at those, at those relatively, uh, at those extremely high prices. And again, $8,000 per year now sounds like a quaint price, uh, given the fact that we, we see prices um, routinely in the hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars. Um, and so it's important to recognize that there's been substantial public funding um, for COVID-19 uh, treatments, including remdesivir. Um, there's, there was early testing done by the CDC and the U.S. Army um, in, in, uh, in, help, in working with Gilead um, to screen the product uh, for Ebola. Um, ultimately, randomized control trials sponsored by NIAID um, showed that the drug didn't work in Ebola. Now it might, it actually, it turns out it does seem to have some activity in, in coronavirus. The Moderna vaccine development um, is being uh, substantially invested in by, by uh, the U.S. government through BARDA. Um, and in the most recent coronavirus package, there was a $483 million um, investment. Um, now, uh, and, and trials for this product are being uh, funded and conducted by NIH. Um, and so how will this taxpayer investment be reflected in the price? Unfortunately, in the COVID-19 relief bill, there were no restrictions on pricing, only a vaguely worded statement that the Secretary of HHS may take such measures authorized under current law to ensure that vaccines will be, will be affordable in the commercial market. Um, fortunately, there is actually law that, that, um, that gives basis for the government uh, to try to um, you know, provide a, a reasonably priced product if the pharmaceutical manufacturer doesn't provide a, a high price product. And again, a lot of the pharmaceutical manufacturers have said the right thing right now um, about how they're gonna price their products, but there is a safety net in case that doesn't happen um, called government patent use, which allows the government to um, uh, develop manufacturing for patented products and pay a reasonable entire compensation to the patent holder or what's called margin rights under the Bayh-Dole Act. Um, so with that as a, as a background, um, I want to um, focus on these, uh, these questions initially uh, and then turn to questions from the audience. Um, but first, um, you know, I want to see if any of our, other, of our panelists have any thoughts about how to best balance speed and rigor. Perhaps maybe, Lauren, you could start um, with that one, given the fact that you know, speed is, and, and is really uh, you know, fundamental to the, to the work that you're doing. Yeah, it is, it's an enormous challenge, right? The, the, the work that we're doing now in a week is typically the, amount, the same amount of work that we would do in three months and take time to validate our models and cross-check and debug and write. It's, it's a different kind of work than the development of, of vaccines or pharmaceuticals. But, um, but nonetheless, people are looking to the projections of our models to think about what the future might hold and to make decisions that are going to impact people's lives. So um, it's, it is a huge challenge for every single person in my field. And although I've been in the world of pandemic preparedness and pandemic modeling for years, we never modeled this scenario, right? We're all focused on influenza. This is a different virus. This is a virus where we're having to resort to measures we never even contemplated before. So it's, there's a lot of like very quick work being done, quick validation, et cetera. One approach to it that's, I don't know if it translates to other disciplines, but one approach, and I mentioned this in my, my brief remarks, is you know, the CDC is intentionally taking what they call an ensemble forecasting approach, right? They are really reaching out to all the modelers in the field, all the experts and saying, you know, we know you're doing this quickly, you have different expertise, show us all the models. Let's try to understand what they're telling us collectively. We understand that there's gonna be limitations to each one. Um, and, uh, and, and they are trying to build bridges between modelers, between the decision-making communities and the modelers. 
but that doesn't necessarily translate. I saw a few questions in the, you know, the question, are you, are you advising this, are you advising that? I mean, no, not everybody is looking at all the models, you know, and many decision makers don't even know what a model is. So, um, so anyways, it's, it's, it's getting back to the question. It's, it's very challenging in our world. We're just doing a lot of, you know, a lot of people in a team cross-checking things and then comparing with other teams and then taking an ensemble approach where we're, you know, we're looking at other models, not as competitors, but as things that we can learn from. And we want to hear from the other modelers and how they're doing things. Fung, do you want to take a stab? Um, yeah, um, sorry, what is, what is the question again, sorry? Trying to balance uh, speed and rigor in, in, the, in the design of, of, of what you're, you're coming out with. Yeah, I think it's really important um, to, to balance the two. Um, so because we have a pandemic and, and a lot of things are, um, are we're learning on a real, in a real time basis. Um, a lot of these tests are, are really need to be developed um, in much shorter time than what is possible uh, in the current pan pandemic situation. So uh, for instance, uh, many of the tests developers um, didn't even have access to real patient samples uh, to validate the tests uh, sufficiently uh, before the tests are needed. And, um, and so, so I think, um, you know, it, it's a difficult situation and, and I think um, people uh, need to be able to coordinate um, more and, and people are already very collaborative during this pandemic uh, period, but, um, but I think figure out better ways to be able to um, to work with the regulatory infrastructure that we have, uh, but also making sure that we can move quickly uh, is, is, is the challenge that we face. Um, the regulatory system is not designed to fight the pandemic. Uh, it's, it's designed to protect uh, patients and, and ensure safety, but, um, but those are things uh, that are, uh, are, are difficult to do um, if you need to be operating um, very, very quickly. And, um, and so I think that that's very much a big challenge. Great. And um, Patrick, why don't I pose that second question to you uh, first about uh, combating misinformation and, you know, how maybe how is it done? You know, how is the um, public conversation around coronavirus in Singapore? And I want to echo uh, with that a question from Sruthi in the audience about how do we educate the public who uh, you know may not understand um, what needs to be done for public health issues, and, and you know, how do you how do you address that in Singapore, and what lessons are there for the United States in that? Yeah, so I think that this boils down to the compact that the public has with the government in terms of uh, looking at certain bodies that rightfully or wrongly are seen as single sources of truth, particularly in these periods where there's a lot of noise in the, uh, in the ecosystem. So I think that um, being able to establish that you're getting the best data that you have out there as rapidly as possible, that you're being open about it, and acknowledging that uh, you, are, you don't have all the information and that there are certain caveats, but this is the best guess, I think are, are things that people do respond to. You know, once they know that you're doing your DNA, and also I think I wanted to emphasize that it's not just um, being able to do it within your own system, but also integrating data and, and findings that are coming out from the, the rest of the world and conveying that in a simple way to the public, uh, I think is very, very important. And, and, and harmonizing the messages so that people don't hear different uh, strands of information, but that takes a significant amount of coordination and work because you know, even in Singapore, which is much smaller than the US, you know, there are different ministries and they uh, have different um, missions to fulfill. So being able to access a common whole of government way of attacking this problem and conveying that to the public is, I think, extremely important to give people something to look to as a, a, a single source of truth. Um, and so I think that's what we've tried to do in Singapore. Um, and, um, and this speaks to when, when, when stay at home, quarantine, stay at home, you know, don't break it. And there are good reasons for that, not just for yourself, but for the community at large. I mean, these sorts of messages, and I think conveyed in the right way, people do understand those things. 
uh, I guess I'll stop there. Great, Lauren, do you wanna, you talked a little bit about communicating with policymakers. How do you communicate your message to the public? Um, it's difficult. I think, you know, what Patrick said is really important, like communicating as clearly as possible, you know, what, what the message is. And, you know, in our case, we are, we've really done a lot of work to try to clearly communicate uncertainty, right? Like not just what can we know with our models, but what can't we know? And in particular, as people are talking about forecasting now and what's going to happen if there's going to be waves, to communicate that uh, what's going to happen is absolutely going to depend on the decisions that every single person makes and that policymakers make. And that um, while we can, we can, if we know how people are going to behave, we can say a lot about what a virus is going to do, but, but we don't know how people are going to behave. And, um, and, um, and just trying to, try to, try to communicate that in a way where you're not actually showing them exponential functions, right? You're just, you're trying to explain to them that the behavior that you, the, the decisions you make today, your behavior today may have ramifications down the road that, that we can't see now. And that if you wait too long to take measures to slow transmission, to pull back, you know, behavior, then it may be too late. And you're going to go from a hundred new hospitalizations to 500 new hospitalizations before you know it. So just trying to communicate in simple ways, these sort of, complicated nonlinear uh, 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 exponential trajectories that were that we have influence over. Okay, great, thanks. So um, turning back to Fung, a couple people uh, like Sendhill in the, in the Q&A have asked about um, getting uh, solutions uh, up to scale and to be able to benefit people equitably uh, and trying to, and you know, one of the questions that I touched on was about the, the cost of products. Um, have you thought uh, about how um, you know, if this uh, diagnostic works, um, you know, how you would work to try to make it equitably available both in the U.S. and in, in other countries? Yeah, a very good question. Um, so we, we are, um, so the test has, uh, the current test has not received FDA approval yet, um, uh, even for emergency use. And so we're working uh, with uh, various partners to, to be able to get uh, to the EUA. Uh, at the same time, we began to talk with different uh, component manufacturers that includes um, uh, pro uh, companies that make proteins, uh, companies that make various components of this. And uh, we're just in the process uh, of figuring out uh, how to uh, scale up the different pieces. Uh, it seems that um, proteins and, and, uh, and the nucleic acids can be made uh, at scale so that people can run uh, hundreds of thousands of tests uh, per day, uh, or maybe, maybe even more um, if, if there is a need. And, um, and so, so that's part of what I'm trying to figure out right now. Great. Um, any, any other panelists want to chime in on that particular topic? Uh, um, so otherwise, I want to I move on uh, now to Patrick and ask about uh, coordination uh, of the scientific and public health enterprise. One of the features of the, of the U.S. healthcare system is that public health is not uh, coordinated from, from the top of government. It's a, uh, you know, generally a local, um, you know, state-based uh, organization. Uh, you know, Lord knows we're really seeing that uh, in action right now. Um, how is public health organized in, in Singapore? Is it more coordinated at the top? And does that lead to better coordination of the, um, you know, care that's delivered and, and the, the science that's, uh, that's undertaken? Yes. Well, I mean, I think I must say that the, the size of Singapore makes it more similar to a small city in the U.S., <laughs> than across the entire country. Uh, but yes, uh, the public health efforts are centrally coordinated. Uh, for instance, if uh, just recently there is a need to roll out um, nationally uh, sample swabbing collections to test uh, all, um, all people in nursing homes. Uh, be it in the, 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 the care teams or the residents, uh, that's done across the entire country in one shot. So I think those are the sorts of things that can be achieved in a central coalition. It means refocusing public resources from one part of the healthcare system to another healthcare system. Or if you want to set up a, a new um, center to house a re re recovering COVID patients. It means reallocating resources from one part of the healthcare system to another part of the healthcare system. So I think those sorts of things do need to be centrally coordinated because there are always trade-offs. 
so the answer to that question is yes. Um, and uh, you know, the task force that does this meets twice a week. You know, they look at the demand, they look at the needs, and then they decide, I need to move these people from here to here, or I need to train new sets of swabbers. And then how do we scale that up? And where, where are the training staff that can do that? So I think those sorts of things are things that um, are centrally coordinated. No, and there are challenges, right? Because there's always the more coordination, sometimes the less speed you have, but you have scale. Um, and I think that's the trade-off that we uh, are trying to achieve. Um, constant communication, I think, is the essential aspect. All right. Um, and so, uh, Lauren, there are a bunch of questions in the chat rooms about your models and the, the way that you can uh, in, uh, include other things in the models, including uh, Anand asks specifically about uh, herd immunity and whether or not that can be included in a model. And, and in, the, in the question and answer, Chris Andelman asks about um, modeling impacts on businesses and tourists and others. How, how much can you um, involve, uh, you know, how, how broadly can you include these kinds of different factors in, these, in the models that you're building? Um, yeah, I've seen some of these questions. They're great questions, and I wish I <laughs> had an hour to go through all of them. So the question about herd immunity is really, so herd immunity comes out of the model, right? It's you put in these assumptions, and then the question is, how many people have to be either naturally immunized because they were infected or vaccinated in order to stop the epidemic from spreading? And, and the question that Anant raised is, you know, look, she, uh, I think they're correctly inferred that um, we were assuming that once somebody is infected and recovered, they're, they're immunized. And that is true, that the results that I showed you assume that. And if, if that is the case, or at least, you know, immunized for long enough that, uh, you know, they're not, we don't, they don't risk um, reinfection within the time course of the, of, the, of the model I'm showing you, then the estimate is that, you know, 60% or more people have to be infected before we achieve herd immunity. However, and it's, it's not conclusive whether people are immunized uh, either temporarily or permanently following infection, if it turns out that people uh, become susceptible to infection again sometime after they've recovered, then it's a totally different ballgame. Then we, we, we won't necessarily achieve herd immunity by the time 60% uh, of the people are infected because many of those people may be susceptible again. So um, those results that I showed you and a lot of the modeling that, we're, that many groups are doing now are, are kind of optimistically assuming that at least transiently after somebody is infected that they're not going to be susceptible again to reinfection. Um, and, and then the question about the modeling the businesses specifically and travel specifically, you know, the issue right now is that this is so unprecedented. We don't have any historical data on what if you close non-essential businesses uh, or you open, uh, or maybe you open them to 25% capacity. We've never lived through that. So we have no data to say, how does that translate to how quickly or slowly a disease will spread. And usually when we're building models and putting our parameters, our inputs into them, we look to historical data to figure out if I change this in the model, what, what would that probably do in the real world? So the best we can do right now is look at whatever data we can get our hands on for the last like two months in the United States and other countries where we can say, okay, you know, we're seeing in the cell phone data in, in Austin, Texas, that between March 24th and April 20th, people stop going out of their house. And then we can estimate, looking at that and the epidemiological data, okay, when people stop doing that, how quickly was the disease spreading? And then we see between April 20th and you know, May 1st, people started to go out of the house, some of the essential, non-essential businesses started coming online. What did that do to transmission? And so in real time, we're trying to get a handle on how these partial openings and individual behaviors uh, impact the speed with which COVID-19 spreads, but really it's, it's sort of guesswork right now. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're heading towards the end of our time together. So I want to finish up with one uh, common question for, uh, for each of the panelists to, uh, to take on in turn. Um, and maybe we'll go backwards this time and start with Fung and then go to Patrick and then Lauren. And it's kind of a two-part question. And so the first part is building off a lot of questions in the chat uh, and in the Q&A. A lot of people are, want to know, uh, you know, a lot of people are maybe our RSI students and, uh, you know, they're going to be students this coming summer or were students recently or our college students. Um, and, you know, how can they help? What sorts of things can they do? And then second, um, what has RSI meant to you and what has RSI meant to your career? Um, and so if you could reflect on, on both of those things um, each in turn, uh, I think we'll have to unfortunately end it there. And then um, I know there are a lot of questions left over in the chat and in the Q&A, and I'm going to try to make a copy of all of them uh, and circle back as best I can to the people who asked them um, with, uh, with answers. So 
um, let's start with Fung. Fung, um, so first, um, what can listeners do, um, you know, who are maybe are recent RSI graduates? And, and second, what has RSI meant to you in your career? Um, so, so first of all, I think, um, you know, we're, we're in a very uh, special and very um, uh, strange time. And, uh, and there are a lot of things that I think uh, young students of RSI uh, can, can contribute to. Um, so first of all, if there are uh, specific areas or specific problems that uh, you, you, you feel really um, passionate about solving, um, reach out to researchers or other people uh, in industry or government uh, and see whether or not you can, you can be of assistance. Maybe there's an internship, maybe there's a, a, a virtual um, um, sort of a assistance ship that you can provide uh, to some of these efforts. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, you know, there are, there, are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people who are really um, affected uh, in a very bad way by, by this pandemic. And, uh, and, you know, donations to food banks, uh, donations to various uh, efforts to help people who are um, severely affected by, by the outbreak. Uh, that could also uh, be, be really important for, for society. Um, in terms of what I got out of uh, RSI, um, I think the community of the Rikwais uh, was the most important thing. Uh, some of my best friends are, um, are fellow Rikwais that I met uh, during my time at, at RSI. And then also being able to, to uh, join this panel and be a part of, um, you know, part of this really great discussion uh, is, is just another example of how amazing the RSI community has been and all the alumni um, that, that have uh, come, come through the program. And um, I hope that we'll be able to continue to, uh, to um, be a community and, and uh, work together, uh, especially uh, when uh, we're faced with uh, these important uh, challenges. Very good. Thank you very much. Patrick? Yes, uh, I think in terms of what people can do in our uh, fellow RSI staff, I think that, uh, no, I do echo uh, Dr. Tang's, uh, uh, Feng Tang's thing. I would say that living now in this period where most of us are talking by Zoom, uh, stay connected and uh, be connected to one to each other and also to the, the elderly. And so I think this is a very, uh, they need that type of uh, social support, I think, uh, during this very uh, challenging period. In terms of uh, what RSI, I mean, RSI was transformational for me. I mean, it just, uh, being in an environment where everybody lived, breathed, doing science, really shifted uh, my career in that I wanted to be a scientist. And I think that you know, this is something that, it's one of the few things that would make me come back to attend a web seminar at 4 a.m. in the morning. So this is how much it means to me. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Lauren. Great. So um, I think it's great if you guys want to get involved either on the research side or in the social side, you know, helping people who are really challenged right now, definitely keeping, keeping in touch with virtually people who uh, are high risk because they're older or because they have high risk conditions and keeping them feeling connected and, and not lonely, I think is a really important thing for us all to be doing. For those of you who really want to get involved in some of the kinds of research you've heard here, or if you look through the list of Rickoids and you see all the other amazing things that are, are, are happening, uh, send us an email and in the, in the subject line say Rickoid emailing and we'll respond um, if, you, if you're interested in getting, um, getting involved in any of the things we're doing. And in my consortium, I'm welcoming students and it's very self-organized, the kind of research that people are doing. So maybe if you're interested, you can certainly jump in and, and see where you, can, where you can help out. And then um, uh, RSI was just a, a really formative, amazing experience in my life. Um, I made great friends from around the world. And uh, it, I had my first taste of using math to solve real world problems. Um, and it really just empowered me to make, and made me feel like I can, I can keep on doing this. And it's really helped, as I said earlier, helped to launch my career. So, so happy to be here and talk to all of you. Well, that, that I, thank you very much. And that was a great, uh, a great set of, uh, of, 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 it was a great conversation. And, and, and thanks everybody for all their time and expertise. And uh, Mrs. D, back to you. Wow. I just want to say on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Center for Excellence in Education and my staff who worked on this project, thank you, thank you to RSI alumni, Rickoids we call them, after Admiral Rickover for being on this panel. As guests of this event today, you learned about the product of the center's many years of educational STEM programming. The center 
nurtures scientific and technological talent. And you saw it firsthand today. It's the center's friends, individuals, corporations, and organizations that make our efforts possible. You are invited to review our website. It provides information about all CEE's programs, the Biology Olympiad for thousands of students each year, and our teacher enrichment program for under-resourced teachers and rural and urban students in 12 states. You're also invited to register for another event coming up, our Congressional Luncheon event on Capitol Hill, held annually, minus the lunch. It's on May 22nd at noon, where you can hear from additional students and our honorary members of Congress. You're invited to partner with the Center in your philanthropy because participation is needed and appreciated at this challenging time. I trust you found this session helpful, informative, and a good use of your time. Be well, be safe, thank you.